Good morning, everyone. This morning, we're joined by Mark Howard, Professor of Government and Law and founding director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative, which was established five years ago here at Georgetown. Well, Mark, thank you for taking the time to join us for this conversation. Let's jump right in. You've become one of our nation's leading scholars and advocates for criminal justice and prison reform though your training and your early work was in the field of European and comparative politics. Could you share with us a little bit about what brought you to your current field of study and advocacy? What values are, are animating your current work? Well, first off, thank you, Jack, for having me uh, join your show. Uh, it's great to be with you. And uh, you know, you're getting right into the heart of a key and deep personal question for me, which is why I essentially changed my career to start working in a completely different area. As you mentioned, my training, my PhD, and what I was hired at Georgetown to do was working on European politics, questions of democratization, questions related to immigration in Europe. And I felt very passionate about those issues. I wrote two books, many articles. I have a deep connection to Europe. I'm half French, I'm a dual citizen. I speak German and Russian and lived in those countries. And I was really engrossed in that area. But I had a personal connection to criminal justice that uh, went from kind of lurking in the background and being something that I would tell people about in private to suddenly really taking over my life and really reshaping my career entirely. And that was the wrongful conviction of my childhood friend, Marty Tankliff, who I've known since we were three years old. And on the first day of our senior year of high school, Marty woke up to a horrible crime scene. He found both of his parents brutally murdered in the night. And by the end of that day, Marty was arrested and charged with killing his parents, thanks to some absolutely horrible and corrupt police work that was essentially perpetrated upon him. And he was ultimately convicted and sentenced to 50 years to life in a maximum security prison. Now, I believe Marty was innocent and I advocated for him at the time during our senior year of high school. I actually wrote about it in our high school newspaper called the Purple Parrot, which in retrospect is the only newspaper in all of New York and the, and the whole country that actually got the story right, which was that Marty was innocent and Marty had nothing to do with it, that his father's business partner hired hitmen who killed Marty's parents and paid off a detective to frame Marty. But I won't go further into that story, but to me, um, it was something that I always thought about and it always stayed with me, but I moved on with my life. Marty likes to joke and says, Mark went to Yale, I went to jail. And in a way that's true, those are two very different places. Um, and then I moved on and, and I went to Berkeley for my PhD and, and um, got married to my wife, Lise, who's also a Georgetown professor. We have two children. And at some point, it, it started to really weigh on me and I reached out to Marty. We reconnected first through letters, then phone calls. And then I started visiting him in prison. And I made him a promise in the prison visiting room that I would do everything I could to help get him out of prison. And I didn't even know at the time what that meant, but it really meant a complete reshaping of everything I was doing. I started doing work on his case. I started meeting with his legal teams. I started writing about his case. I wrote actually a, an, an amicus brief that became part of his last and ultimately successful appeal. And then I made the decision, which as you know, Jack, is something that not many universities have this policy, but Georgetown allows its faculty to have eight semesters of tuition-free education. And I think I'm still the first and only one uh, a tenured faculty member to get a law degree. And I decided I was gonna get my JD and, and my statement of purpose was that I wanna get my friend out of prison. He was wrongfully convicted. Now Marty was exonerated just before I started. And so many people thought, oh, okay, Marty's out, Mark, you can go back to your other work on European politics. But the way I put it is that my eyes had been opened to injustice through Marty's case and I just couldn't close them again. And so then I kept going deeper and deeper and I started teaching in prison. I started teaching about prisons. I started bringing students into prison. And that ultimately led to us founding the Prisons and Justice Initiative, which I'm sure we'll wanna get into. But that's the personal backstory that really is foundational I think about it every day. It's still what drives me and motivates me is the experience that Marty went through and, and how profoundly it has affected me. Well, thank, thank you, Mark. Thanks for sharing that with us. And let, let's pick up on, on the Prisons Injustice Initiative. Through, through the initiative, you're working to end the injustices in the prison system and to uplift the dignity and humanity of people incarcerated. 
Projects such as the Prison Scholars Program and the Pivot Program have had a profound impact for both incarcerated students and returning citizens. How would you describe the initiative's goals and some of the projects that you've launched over these years? Well, Jack, we're doing so many projects and programs that it's hard to really summarize them. But if I had to, it's really recognizing the humanity in all people and supporting people to become their best selves and to recognize that, as Brian Stevenson so famously says, that people are better than the worst thing they've ever done. And that with proper support, they can actually succeed, they can even thrive. And in our case, we're really putting Georgetown University behind that effort in a way that is, I think, unprecedented in terms of university programs working to attack mass incarceration through humanization of people. And so, as you mentioned, we have the Prison Scholars Program, which started out as an all volunteer program at the DC jail with our partners at the Department of Corrections in DC. Very soon after that went to credit bearing courses where students would take courses and actually get Georgetown credits on Georgetown transcripts that they could then use perhaps to transfer to other places or to have as uh, something they could share with prospective employers when they were released. Um, and then just recently we've taken a really big step and uh, joining a very select group of schools and, and BARD, as you know, the BARD Prison Initiative has been around for 20 years and they've really set a standard that uh, we've now reached that level by actually offering a degree granting program where uh, what, what we're looking forward to is that in five years, we'll be hosting Georgetown graduations. And I hope you'll be with us, Jack, at those graduations at the Patuxent Institution, which is a prison in Maryland. And we'll continue with our DC jail program and our credit bearing courses, but we'll also be offering eventually Georgetown degrees to very highly qualified, uh, motivated, uh, incredibly loyal Hoyas who happened to be behind bars and took a different life course. Uh, we also sure. have the pivot program and I know you've talked to Pietro Rivoli. I won't go into further depth, but that's really the, the, the first university re-entry program that's partnership with our McDonough School of Business where we take what, what are called returning citizens and we give them essentially a year's worth of education and training and then internships with DC area companies and uh, so far we've had great success. We're on our third cohort. We're really proud of the graduates of the program. And again, we're setting a new standard for what universities can be doing. And we get a lot of inquiries from other universities. You know, how do you do it? How can we do it? Um, and I think Georgetown's really getting recognized in this area. So um, these, these two programs are something that I'm very proud that we've been able to create with our team here. Share a little bit more about the new program in Maryland with the Maryland prison system. It's a liberal arts program, Yeah, undergraduate uh, for yeah. incarcerated students. Can you talk a little bit That's more right. about the program? Sure. So um, it's a program that it's a five-year Bachelor of Liberal Arts degree, and it's within the college. So Georgetown College is um, the, the uh, sponsor of it, you might say. And uh, we will have students who are doing the full Georgetown curriculum. They'll be taking the problem of God and of course, and, and many other um, seminal classic Georgetown courses. There are um, three different majors that essentially amount to philosophy, history, and then social sciences. And um, really we're trying to give people a foundation in critical thinking, in debate, in uh, familiarity with, with the classics and the canons and, really prepare them to be um, successful, well-educated, critical thinkers who will be able to succeed in different areas of their professional lives when they leave prison. There's a tremendous amount of research, Jack, that shows that people who are incarcerated, when they acquire higher education in prison, they do not go back to crime. Recidivism rates drop by 43% with just as little as one higher education course. It's a, it's a life-changing, it's, it's actually a, a light switch and I've seen it in the eyes of my students in prison so many times. And you see the, the intellectual engagement. And it's something that's so beautiful to behold. And I know you had an opportunity to go visit and speak to our scholars at the DC jail. Um, and for me, this is something that I'm just so excited to see people go all the way to the end. You know, Bard, they've, they've graduated over 500 uh, Bard graduates from the prison initiative. They have a recidivism rate that's essentially zero, zero violent crimes, no one goes back to criminal activity when they've acquired an education. So I think they are um, really going to make Georgetown proud. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now, throughout the pandemic, COVID has had a devastating impact on incarcerated individuals, including here in, in the District of Columbia. The toll of the pandemic on those living in our prisons and jails has been significant. What are some of the most critical issues that, that you think need to be addressed, both in the short term and in the longer term? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And, and thanks for drawing attention to the situation because it's tragic. Um, there have been um, over 300,000 positive COVID cases behind bars. There have been thousands of deaths. There have been thousands of correctional officers who've died. Essentially, prisons are so um, packed with people under conditions that are essentially the antithesis of social distancing, where there is no separation, where hand sanitizer is considered contraband where people are either mixing very closely and therefore spreading disease, or, and this is the only alternative, held in solitary confinement where they're essentially separated. And that has tremendously damaging psychological effects. And so um, it's, it's a really terrible situation. Different jurisdictions have chosen different solutions. Some where they're allowing more mixing, but then COVID spread more, spreads more. And then others where they keep people in solitary confinement, COVID stays low, but people have really damaging consequences from it. Um, I think what the solution would be, and I hope that there are lessons to be learned, which is we need to decrease levels of incarceration. There have been many people who've been released early with COVID or who've had home confinement, and it has not had an impact on their criminal activity. Um, many people who are in prison, certainly people who are in for nonviolent and drug crimes, many things that have actually become legalized should not be behind bars. And so my solution would be to have fewer people in prison, have them in for not as long, because there's also research that shows that people age out of crime and criminal activity. And so there's a certain period where separation from society is necessary for public safety. But then after a certain period of time, it's no longer doing any good, it's incredibly expensive. And so I hope that there are lessons that we'll learn from this tragedy, but it's been very sad. It's been hard on our scholars in our program. We haven't been able to see them in over a year. We're continuing our classes in the DC jail through tablets, um, but it's very limited. They don't have webcams, we can't see them. We upload lectures, we have assignments, they respond in writing. We're really doing the best we can, but we miss them, they miss us, and we're really looking forward to hopefully being able to resume in-person activities soon. We, we have seen the extraordinary impact that education can have on the lives of those who are incarcerated and those who have been denied opportunities. Can you talk about education and the transformative possibilities it offers? Why, why our focus on education? Yeah, uh, education is the key to changing people's lives. One of the things that I've learned, and I know that it might be hard for some people to understand this if they haven't been working in this area and had some of the experiences in prison that I have, but most people don't choose to go into crime as a vocation. They often are going through a path of poverty, of inequality, of oftentimes um, neglect, both in their family and in society. And they start going down a road that closes the door on education and takes them into unfortunate activities and behaviors that then leads them to getting sentenced to prison. And what happens is that, although you might think that those are attributes of the person, the activity, the crimes that were committed, really they're attributes of a situation that they were in. And when they're in a different situation and when they have the opportunity to engage in positive programs and especially education programs, they completely transform. I mean, this is the, the light switch moment that I was referring to earlier where you can just see the engagement in people's eyes when they start um, debating ideas. Uh, I, I remember a, a, a reflection that was made by the D DC Director of Corrections, Quincy Booth, uh, who's a, a wonderful supporter of our program, who's himself a former school teacher. And when we first started the program, it was on a pilot basis. It was tentative. It was, let's see how it goes. A month in, he called me and he said, this is extraordinary. He said, there's a culture change that's happened you know, as a result of your program. He said, people are now having completely different conversations. He said, you know, I walked onto a housing unit and usually people would be yelling, you know, we need more of this, we need more of that, complaining about things. 
And he said, I walked in and they were having a debate about whether utopia, the concept of utopia is compatible with capitalism where there's winners and losers. I mean, that's a fascinating you know, debate that there's no real answer to. And he walks into a prison housing unit and they're having a really deep discussion about this. And he said, this is the kind of cultural change that will lead people to re-enter society safely, not go back, become leaders, become role models. And that's what we're trying to do with the scholars program. It's what we're doing at the pivot program. Really, we're trying to have an impact on our Georgetown Hoyas as we really consider them ours on their lives. But we're also trying to change the narrative and set a new standard, both for what universities can do and also for the potential of human beings who've made mistakes. We're all human, we all make mistakes. And when someone earns the second chance and proves that they deserve it and then makes the most of it, to me, that's beautiful. And that's what I live for. Thank you, thank you. Mark, last year you founded a new nonprofit organization the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. Can you talk about the work of the project, its mission? What brought about its creation and how do you see the work advancing? Yeah, thank you for letting me talk about the Douglass Project. And so um, I founded it um, about a year ago. And really the idea was to take some of the work that we've been doing at Georgetown or some of the experiences that I've had through that work at Georgetown and in the DC area and scale it nationally. And to put it, Bluntly, I feel like we've developed a formula that is magical, which is to bring somebody inside of a prison who's never been there before and to allow them to interact with incarcerated people and connect with them on a human level, to go beyond the stereotypes, the scary TV shows and cops and law and order and so on, but really to see them as human beings, to see how they talk about their family members or their new niece who was born or to, to see them choke up because they miss their mom's funeral or to, to connect with, with them on this deeply human level means that when they leave prison, when, when the visitors leave prison that day, they're transformed. And I remember you were very moved by the experience you had coming in and the conversations you had. And really what I wanted to do with the Douglas Project is allow people across the country to have that experience. And so we're building a team a nationwide organization that is going to facilitate prison visits all around the country. And actually, we recently hired our chief operating officer, who's Brian Ferguson, who is a Georgetown alum, who has himself an incredible story and was 11 and a half years in prison, wrongfully convicted, was serving a life without parole sentence, was then exonerated, came transferred to Georgetown, graduated with honors, and then became a Marshall Scholar in the UK, and now is back and he's uh, our chief operating officer. So we're really trying to um, take this formula of the magical prison visit, which I've now, I've brought thousands of Georgetown students on. I've brought hundreds of observers, guest speakers. Of course, one of them was Kim Kardashian who came and who filmed our program. It was featured prominently in her documentary. And I really want everybody across the country to be able to have that experience. And so that's what the Douglas Project is trying to do. Thank you, thank you. And thanks for taking this time for this conversation. And thank you for your exceptional leadership this is, this is urgent and important work, and we're deeply grateful to you, Mark, for everything that you mean to this place. In closing, is there a message you'd like to share with our community? Yeah, um, there's so many, um, but you know, I really hope that people will um, take the time to listen and engage, to keep an open mind. And I know that some people who may have already been inside or who may be very activated on these issues already see what I see, but I really wanna reach beyond that. And I'm thinking for people who might be skeptical to give us a chance and to come inside with us. And so I wanna extend an invitation to our viewers, whether they're from Georgetown or from outside to come inside with us and to see the magic that we're creating because it really is something extraordinary to see a class filled with people who until recently had no hope in their lives, who had no dignity no humanity provided to them. And suddenly to see them receiving it is something that is so magical, so heartwarming that I really want to share that with everyone. And again, I just wanna say in closing that I'm so proud to be at a university that supports this work. And I wanna thank you personally, Jack, because you were there from the very beginning in the creation of the Prisons and Justice Initiative and in seeing the value of this work, in trusting me when we took new leaps and bounds in different directions 
And I hope that your trust has been validated and that, that we've lived up to the promises that I've made. But we've really reached a point where there is no university in the country and not in the world that is doing as much as Georgetown to really push this issue and to humanize and support incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people and to do it in a way with dignity. So I want to, I'll close with that note of thanks to you, Jack. Well, thank you so much, Mark. You're very kind. Thanks again for joining us for this conversation and for all of your great leadership, both to Georgetown and to our local and national communities. And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya, everywhere.